Okay, well, I want to make sure we have plenty of time for our conversation. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to everybody who's joining. Thank you so much for, for being here with us this afternoon for a conversation on hydrogen. Um, my name is Susie Spiegelman. I'm Director of Partnerships at Clean Energy Trust. For those of you who are new to CET, at a very high level, we invest in and support emerging clean technology startups from across the Midwest region of the United States. Uh, additionally, we host a variety of events and programming throughout the year to build the clean tech ecosystem, welcoming folks like you to learn about the industry, support our mission, and help scale emerging clean technologies. If you'd like to learn about our work or get involved, please visit our website, sign up for our newsletter, or feel free to reach out to me directly. Uh, today's conversation will be moderated by CET's Managing Director, Paul Seidler. He'll kick things off with a quick Hydrogen 101 session, followed by a group discussion with our panelists. At the end, I'll be back for audience Q&A, so as you think of questions to, to ask during the session, please pop them into the Q&A window on your Zoom screen, and we'll get to them in the order that, they, that we receive them. Uh, finally, at the end of this session, uh, we'll be giving you a sneak peek to our next webinar, uh, and it's a really good one, so be sure to stick around until the end so that we can get you those details and you can have first access to sign up. So with all of that out of the way, I'm going to turn things over to Paul to get started. So Paul, the, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Susie, and welcome everyone for joining us this afternoon. Apparently, I'm not the only one who is uh, fascinated with uh, hydrogen. It is a very popular topic. We got a ton of interest in this event. So, um, you know, we decided to, to call up three of our favorite uh, engineers in, in the space and come talk shop with us. So this is gonna be a fun conversation. Um, let's, uh, let's do a quick round of uh, intros, um, starting with uh, Maggie, you wanna introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Paul, and, and thanks everybody for taking the time to be here and for having us. Uh, I'm Maggie Pakula. I'm the Vice President of Strategy at Invenergy, which is headquartered in Chicago and is a global developer of primarily renewable energy. Uh, we also are starting to get into the transmission space and we are just generally trying to be a, a player in everything in the energy and clean energy ecosystem. So as part of my role in strategy, I have a lot of things under my purview, but one of them is emerging technologies and what more exciting emerging technology is there than hydrogen? Great, thank, thank you, Maggie. Amy? Hi, um, I'm Amy Adams. I'm the Vice President of Fuel Cell and Hydrogen Technologies at Cummins. Uh, Cummins is a company that's been around for a long time, more than a hundred years, and had historically been known as a diesel engine and natural gas engine and components company. Um, but as uh, we continue to do, we look at fuel substitution, technology substitution, and several years ago formed a business called at that time Electrified Power as we looked at electrification of uh, vehicles and other industrial equipment. And a year and a half ago, we formed this group called Fuel Cell and Hydrogen Technologies after the acquisition of Hydrogenics. Um, and so now we, we're betting pretty heavily in the hydrogen space, uh, both on the hydrogen production side where we have electrolyzers and on the fuel cell side for mobility and other applications. Um, so thank you for inviting me here today. Glad to be here. Thanks, Amy. Um, Mike. Yeah, hi everyone, Mike Rakowski. I'm the Senior Vice President of Research and Technology Development uh, with GTI, Gas Technology Institute. We are an 80 year old uh, not-for-profit energy technology uh, research and uh, development organization serving the, the natural gas and broader energy industry. Um, so our mission is to take early stage technologies and advance them to commercial solutions for the energy industry's greatest challenges around uh, reliability, affordability, safety, and, and uh, increasingly around sustainability and decarbonization. So we've been working with hydrogen for over 50 years. Our first patent uh, was in 1965, and we've seen a few of the, the hype cycles involved with, with hydrogen over the years. Uh, this one we think is for real. We, we just in, opened our Hydrogen Technology Center about a year ago to further our focus on the hydrogen space as a low carbon uh, energy carrier. So thank you and, and happy to be here. Thanks, Mike. Um, so I failed to introduce myself. I know there are a lot of friends in, in the audience today, but for those of you who well, I've not met yet, my name is Paul Seidler, Managing Director at Clean Energy Trust. 
Um, I've been with the organization for over six years now. I oversee our seed stage investment process and uh, manage our portfolio of early stage climate tech startups. Um, so with that, uh, let's get started. I thought uh, a good way to kick off the conversation would be for me to run through a, a few very short slides just to kind of lay the groundwork and get everyone in the audience on the same page. So Susie, if you want to pull up those slides, we can uh, run through those real quick. Um, so Mike, you mentioned the, the hype cycles that, that we've seen with hydrogen. I remember a decade ago, everyone talking about uh, the new hydrogen economy that was coming. Uh, it never really came, uh, but now all of a sudden there's this new wave of excitement, and I think for good reason. Um, but just taking a step back, zooming out, why, you know, what's all the buzz about hydrogen? And, uh, you know, I think it boils down to a few things, mainly that it is truly clean, even when combusted. It is extraordinarily energy dense, and it is uh, really a ubiquitous resource. Even though it's not naturally occurring, it is the most abundant element um, in the universe. And so any, we're now at a point where anywhere there is electricity and water, we can produce clean hydrogen as long as that electricity is clean. Um, but really, I think what the most compelling thing about hydrogen on the next slide, Susie, is its um, extraordinary versatility. Um, hydrogen has the potential to touch so many things from the energy sector to transportation to even agriculture and um, and renewables. It can it can um, operate. It can it can be utilized as a fuel. It can be utilized as a feedstock to which is really how it's being used today as a feedstock for um, to produce ammonia and fertilizer and for steel processing. Um, and it can really be thought of as a long duration battery in, in many ways. Um, Susie, if we can move to the next slide. Um, and the, when I said the hydrogen economy never really came, that's not to say that there isn't a massive hydrogen industry already, because there is. It's, it's already a very large industry, but traditionally the way hydrogen has been produced is through a process called steam methane reforming or SMR. And this is, uh, you need to have uh, the color guide for hydrogen uh, to know what uh, folks are talking about. You hear a lot of different um, terms being thrown around these days. These are three of the most common uh, colors that refer reference different types of hydrogen production. Um, beyond gray, blue, and green, there's also turquoise and pink and brown, but these are kind of like the three main uh, categories. So gray is really how it's been always been produced. It's how more than 95% of it is produced today through SMR, which does uh, generate a lot of CO2 emissions. Then there's blue hydrogen, which is the idea of just bolting on carbon capture to existing centralized SMR plants. Um, and then there's green hydrogen. And really this is, I think, what's causing the new uh, renewed interest in hydrogen today and where the most potential for growth is. And, and green hydrogen is really zero emissions hydrogen mostly through uh, a technology called electrolysis, but there are also some other uh, technologies uh, being developed. Uh, Susie, let's uh, move to the next slide. And I, I just wanna put out a few numbers. So when I said there already is a large hydrogen economy today, there is, that's a uh, $130 billion industry, but again, it's narrowly focused on a few industrial processes. Um, on the next slide, you'll see that this industry is expected to grow to about $200 billion, by 2025, which is over a 9% CAGR. So um, a lot of that growth is really, really gonna come from green hydrogen as, as those costs come down. And then the last number I want to uh, put forth is, is sort of like one, just one reason why hydrogen is very compelling. Um, it has 200 times the energy density of lithium ion batteries. And so while we've come so far with lithium ion batteries, they just aren't that well suited for everything and they really underperform uh, compared to hydrogen for certain applications. Uh, we'll get into those applications. Susie, you can take the slides down and we're gonna jump right into the conversation. Um, I thought that we would start the questions on the demand side of hydrogen. So, uh, or, I'm sorry, on the supply side of hydrogen. So really um, how hydrogen is produced and the potential for green hydrogen. And then the, talk a little bit about the power to gas market. So. Mike, let's let's go to you first. If you could just share with the audience um, what you're seeing in different types of green 
hydrogen production? What are the different technologies out there um, for, for green hydrogen or low and zero carbon hydrogen production? Yeah, thanks, Paul. So there is quite a uh, rainbow of colors when it comes to low carbon. So I'll try to, to talk about the low carbon aspect. So, um, you know, electrolysis is a, a proven commercial technology. Uh, there's a few electrolysis technologies, alkaline and uh, photon exchange membrane, PEM electrolysis that are commercially available and scaling up to produce hydrogen, uh, you know, through elect electricity and water. And like you said, when the electric is from renewable uh, sources, it's, it's considered green hydrogen. Um, there are a few other electrolysis technologies um, on the horizon, uh, solid oxide, electrolysis, anion exchange membranes, to name a few. Those are, are really not commercially ready yet and need to be uh, further proven through R&D and demonstration. Um, scaling up of those technologies is going to be important uh, when you think of electrolysis, getting to a larger scale uh, at a higher capacity factor and driving costs down. Uh, and the other point about the cost for electrolysis is up to 75% of those production costs are the cost of electricity. So being in a region where uh, low cost renewable electricity at a very high capacity factor is available is important to drive the, the cost of electrolysis down. Currently electrolysis costs are in the range of say $3.50 $3 to $5.50 per kilogram of hydrogen. Um, just to put it in perspective on a on a BTU equivalent basis, that's that's roughly thirty to forty five dollars per million BTUs. So comparing that to say natural gas at a couple of dollars per million BTU, hydrogen, clean hydrogen, is still very expensive. Um, when we look at other clean hydrogen technologies, there is. Uh, uh, steam methane reformation from natural gas with carbon capture and sequestration. There's um, some new technologies. We have one called sorbent enhanced reforming that uh, has inherent carbon capture. And uh, we estimate the costs of uh, producing hydrogen for that technology at 90% carbon capture is about uh, $1.40 per kilogram. So, you know, still um, cheaper, but you know, on a BTU basis, uh, still about $12 per million BTU. And then there's a number of other um, production technologies on the horizon. Uh, methane pyrolysis is one, often called turquoise uh, hydrogen production, where you've got an energy input of renewable electricity, but using pyrolysis of, of methane or natural gas. And uh, the byproduct there is actually a solid form of carbon that could be much easier and cheaper to uh, to store or sequester. And then uh, finally, in the in the clean category is um, uh, biomass uh, gasification. So uh, using some of the same gasification technologies that were commonly used for coal, but uh, applying them to a biomass feedstock or a, even a biomass and coal combined feedstock. Um, the the promise there is that with carbon capture, we could even produce uh, carbon negative hydrogen. So by starting with a biomass feedstock, uh, something above ground, and then capturing the CO2 from the gasification process and sequestering it, uh, we can get to uh, negative carbon. Uh, those are still early stage, uh, need to scale up as well. But the bottom line, we need to have a race to the bottom and scale up all of these technologies and there will be applications for different technologies in different regions and, and uh, different um, applications. So, uh, you know, we want to promote the, the race to the bottom and uh, get as many of those in the portfolio of production technologies uh, underway as soon as possible. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so I heard a lot of different new technologies there uh, under electrolysis. There's alkaline and PEM, and then you also mentioned uh, methane paralysis, um, biomass gasification, um, lots of interesting things. Amy, you are actually in the market bringing some of these new solutions to customers, which, which is actually mature today, uh, solving some of these problems, and what are your customers looking for? Right. Thanks. Yeah. And, and Mike uh, gave a good overview of all of the technologies. I think for Cummins, we're focused right now on electrolysis. With We've got PEM, alkaline, 
and then investment in SOEC and in kind of our portfolio. And alkaline technology has been around for a long time, since the 1940s. So it's a very mature technology. It's been deployed around mostly in those industrial applications that we've just talked about. Um, PEM technology is newer um, in more recent development. Um, for us, it came off starting with our PEM fuel cell development and leveraging some of that technology then into the um, electrolyzers. And really, the, it started emerging with the interest in um, green hydrogen in around 2009. That's when it started accelerating. And just to, as an aside, your point you said at the introduction, all my colleagues I've worked with that have been in hydrogen a long time it keeps saying it's been five years away for the last 25 years. It keeps being five years away and five years away. Um, but I agree that I think now we feel like it's different. Um, uh, so anyway, in, the, in the, the PEM technology now, what our view is, is that can scale up uh, substantially and has more room and runway for further significant cost reduction because it's earlier in its technology lifespan. Um, and just to give an example, we recently uh, commissioned a 20 megawatt PEM electrolysis plant in Canada. And at that time, now this is the largest PEM electrolysis plant in the world. Now that's 20 megawatts. A lot of the discussion now is for uh, plant sizes up to 100 megawatt, 200 megawatts, even people are talking about gigawatt scale plants. Um, and so I think, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a fair way from 20 to a gigawatt, um, but we are seeing a lot of discussion in those, in the, you know, the larger size centralized um, technology. And we believe our PEM technology is the best suited for that because it can scale up easier. It's also uh, has some advantages with renewable energy um, with its fast startup time and how it handles, handles intermittency. Um, SOEC is really in pre-commercialization now. So I think that one's a little further out, far, further down the road. Um, and I think what customers are looking for ultimately, you know, is kind of the overall uh, cost. I know, like Mike said, the, the, the race to the bottom. I mean, there is a huge hydrogen market today, steam methane reform, hydrogen is lower cost than green hydrogen. We need to narrow that gap and we need to get the cost reduction of green hydrogen down closer to the cost of the gray hydrogen. And again, as Mike pointed out, electricity costs are a big input. So in areas that have an abundant renewable energy right now or excess renewable energy or favorable electricity costs, they're probably the ones that are gonna be able to lead where the overall project cost viability is gonna be, you know, is gonna be viable earliest. Um, until the industry continues to scale up and some of those other costs come down. So. Awesome, thank, thank you, Amy. So um, Maggie, I wanna to turn to you as someone who brings the perspective of an IPP, um, an independent power producer, um, who's largely been focused on electrons. Um, what is your interest in hydrogen? Yeah, well, uh, thanks to both Mike and Amy. I think you guys set the stage well for this, both with a general overview of all of the ways to make hydrogen and then Amy going through uh, where I think that we're more focused, which is on the green hydrogen side and, and really working and understanding, working with and understanding electrolyzer technologies and how the capital costs are coming down the curve. Um, I think Amy did a, a good job laying that out. And I think, you know, what we're seeing going out and, and talking to a lot of different electrolyzer vendors is they're trying to figure out how to scale up, including Cummins and previously Hydrogenics, um, is, is along lines of what I think Amy alluded to, we, we definitely see Alkaline and PEM starting to get closer to cost parity right now in a, in a way that even a year ago we weren't seeing um, with solid oxide coming, but, but definitely it seems like those other two are out ahead. Um, we're also starting to see some difference in philosophy between larger scale plants and then more modular sized units, um, which wouldn't even necessarily mean a difference between centralized plants and distributed scale plants, but just really cheap, smaller units that you could build up into a bigger plant if you made the modular size cheap and repeatable. So, you know, we're, we're kind of seeing all this happen. We, I, I think that to Amy's point, um, PEM does have a lot of advantages over alkaline in terms of being easily integratable with renewables because of some of its operational characteristics, ability to ramp, um, ability to ramp all the way down to zero rather than having some base load amount it needs to be running at. And so those are all the considerations that we're taking into account when, when we're talking to electrolyzer vendors. 
Um, you know, we're also talking to them about things like how do you integrate the power electronics? Does it need to be AC or could it be DC coupled to take some advantages of, of DC electricity like you get off of solar? But also to Mike's point, I mean, um, so much of the cost comes from electricity. So on the one hand, you really wanna be working in places where you can get cheap renewable energy. But also a lot of the cost comes from that amortized large capital expense at the outset. So people talk a lot about the applicability of electrolysis to just kind of function as this thing you do with excess renewable right now. If you're curtailing energy, that's an incredibly cheap source of energy that either would be produced at negative price or wouldn't be produced at all. And so that really brings the cost of electricity down. We have to balance that against the fact that you're never curtailing energy to the capacity factors that you'd really want to run an electrolyzer at. So there's a sizing and optimization that happens in there. But in general, I think what we're seeing is well, you know, we're excited about the whole idea of first a green hydrogen economy. So switching the fuels that you talked about at, at the beginning, the, the existing um, industrial gas uses for hydrogen and then growing out the need for green and clean hydrogen um, in other parts of the energy and just general economy space um, as driving a need for renewable energy, which, which we see as a great thing. Um, so, you know, we're, we're looking at different applications. We're, we're looking at ways to really make this economical right now. To Mike's point, it's a far ways from being able to compete on an MMBTU basis, but it's closer on a per kilogram basis. Obviously, incentives will help play into that. And, you know, I think what's great about the conversation we're going to have over the rest of the hour is we'll continue to talk about how the supply side is an important part to talk about, but especially as somebody who's trying to integrate renewables with hydrogen production, we have to be thinking about the location and the, the well, basically the, the transport and end use applications um, in order to, to put together something that optimally is, is the cheapest you can get right now to kind of push things along uh, and, and continue to expand hydrogen production. This, this is gonna be, hydrogen economy 3.0 is really gonna be the one that takes off, I think. Thanks, Mikey. So um, that, that was a perfect cue. You mentioned the end use applications, um, but before we move to the demand side of the equation, I, I do wanna dig in a little bit on the intermediary of, uh, hydrogen storage and transport. So we do have um, what I've kind of been loosely referring to as hydrogen's energy density paradox, which is, I mentioned earlier that its hydrogen density is, is at the top of the list. It's super energy dense, but I should caveat that with that is it is gravimetrically extremely energy dense, but um, so per unit of mass, but per unit of volume, volumetrically, it's at the bottom of the list. It is a very light airy molecule that doesn't want to hang out with its friends and wants to spread apart. And so that uh, isn't a challenge that can't be overcome. It just requires kind of unique storage and transport solutions. So um, Maggie, I, I want to stick with you here. And when you think about project development, and again, being someone who's typically working with electrons, now you're dealing with, with a gas, like what do you have to think about in terms of infrastructure and storage? Uh, um, if you're going to be adding hydrogen to uh, your renewables uh, plants? Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, it will also go into the later conversation about where demand is, is going to be. So a, a lot of the thought right now is the early applications where this makes the most sense is probably places where you can do what steam methane reforming does right now, which is be co-located where you're actually going to be using uh, the hydrogen. So oftentimes ammonia plants have an SMR unit right there on site. We think about it the same way where right now the best, highest NCF product for renewable energy right now is wind in the Midwest and Great Plains area. There's a lot of industrial production that's happening there. Are there places where you could utilize the fact that you have really high NCF wind there to locate at least close enough to a facility that transport and storage doesn't become a huge issue. But storage is difficult. I mean, storage either on just a temporary basis before you uh, align things with what your transport system is gonna be, if that's gonna be two trailers is challenging, but long-term storage is also challenging. Like you mentioned, hydrogen is a light, small molecule that you know often just 
regular rubber seals can't necessarily contain. So it's a it's a challenge from a, a long term perspective, but also from a near term perspective. So it's something that we're starting to investigate. What happens if we need to to pair uh, overground transit with needing to have some amount of on site storage? Um, and then also thinking about the other thing that goes through this really high NCF area of where where wind exists is all of these interstate uh, high pressure gas transmission pipelines. And I know a lot of these companies are starting to think about, well, how do we integrate some small portion of hydrogen into our gas mix? There's a lot of considerations around that equipment itself, other equipment in the system like compressors and then end use applications. But these are all conversations that people are starting to think about. How do we utilize that infrastructure in a way that you know helps advance both the hydrogen economy and keeps that infrastructure used and usable. But that's a place where also the volume consideration comes in because you're offsetting really three times the amount of gas you could for the same amount of energy content. Um, Mike, I know you've been part of a lot of those conversations that Maggie mentioned. So um, where do you stand on the idea of uh, mixing hydrogen into existing natural gas pipelines? Yeah, I mean, certainly one of the uh, promises that, that hydrogen can help fulfill is the need for uh, long duration, large scale energy storage. Uh, and to the extent that uh, with more and more renewable uh, uh, generation sources online and having the need to fulfill that that intermittency, we're going to have a, an increasing need for energy storage. And while batteries are uh, definitely part of that solution, um, they're very good for shorter durations, whereas um, storing energy over a season at a very, very large uh, quantities is is something that's going to need to be uh, replaced that we currently do through through natural gas. So, you know, right now in the United States, we have over 50 times the amount of energy storage capacity in the natural gas system uh, than we do in the electric system uh, through pump storage and battery electric storage. Batteries are growing, but just the the, the amount of energy storage in the natural gas infrastructure. Uh, in the pipeline system, the underground storage system uh, is massive when you think about uh, how that source of, of energy is used. We withdraw about uh, between 15 and 20 percent of, of annual uh, natural gas demand from storage. Um, so having that type of an asset that's very good for long duration, large scale seasonal energy storage is going to be one of the, the pieces in the decarbonization puzzle. And hydrogen through blending into the existing natural gas system can, can start to fulfill that. Uh, there are limitations. There's material limitations uh, on the actual pipeline components and uh, materials with, with steel pipeline um, materials, you have uh, the potential for embrittlement um, and potential integrity issues associated with that. With uh, the plastic and uh, PE type materials, you have potential for permeation where hydrogen, because it's such a small molecule, kind of leaks through. And then you have to think about every other component in the system. You've got compressor stations, regulators, metering stations, valves, seals. And you know, depending on how much of a, a blend there is, uh, of hydrogen into the natural gas system. There could be very differing impacts on a system in the Northeast US, for example, that's uh, older vintage than from one in the, the Southwest. It's really gonna be a system by system uh, impact. Um, however, there are a number of pilots underway, uh, especially in, in Europe. Um, there's the H21 pilot, which is going up to 100% uh, hydrogen. Uh, in an existing natural gas infrastructure. There's a number of, of pilots up to 20% overseas. Mostly in the US, we're starting to see pilots being announced up to a 5% blend. And that's really just kind of the first step. I think as Maggie pointed out, um, at the lower percentages of, of blending, you really don't get um, that much of a, a decarbonization benefit because of the uh, the energy density paradox you mentioned, Paul, um, on a volumetric basis, you only have about a 
third of the amount of energy in, in hydrogen that you do with natural gas. Um, so, you know, if you're going to uh, replace a certain volumetric uh, amount of natural gas with hydrogen, um, you're going to need to move more of, of the, the combined gas through the system or at a higher pressure uh, or a faster flow rate. Uh, otherwise, you're really just getting kind of one third of the, the decarbonization benefit. So there are, there are definitely um, promises for uh, blending into the existing natural gas infrastructure and even potentially going to 100% hydrogen and parts of that infrastructure. Uh, but there will be also a need for modernization investments. So similar to uh, the electric grid, where in order to accommodate more intermittent renewables and distributed energy resources, we had to invest in smart meters and automation and you know, a number of other uh, electric grid modernization uh, investments, uh, similar analogous types investments will be required in the natural gas system to accommodate this this new type of clean energy carrier. <clears throat> Thanks, Mike. And are, are there any innovations underway for hydrogen storage? Not necessarily in, in the pipelines, but just um, other means of storage beyond um, just com compression tanks. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, uh, the real benefit will be using hydrogen in the underground uh, natural gas storage infrastructure, because that's, that's where we'll see the need uh, fulfilled for large scale, um, long duration seasonal energy storage. And, and there it's a matter of understanding the, the impacts on the subsurface uh, and the interactions with the geology. Uh, there's uh, salt dome storage, which um, is very effective for hydrogen. Uh, there's a, a, a large demonstration project out in Utah called the ACES project with uh, uh, Los Angeles Department of, of Water and Power uh, in Magnum um, a developer. And um, there will be uh, hydrogen stored in, in massive underground salt dome storage uh, caverns uh, with the potential for, for much more actually in that area of the country. And then that can be produced uh, you know, through electrolysis on site using renewable electricity throughout the West in the DC transmission system. Um, but then that energy can be used on demand through a, uh, a, a combustion turbine. And initially it'll be, um, you know, like 25% hydrogen blend, but uh, within a matter of years, potentially up to 100% hydrogen blend. So, uh, you know, using the geology where it exists and having that large, very large scale seasonal capability to uh, withdraw the, the energy on demand and fulfill some of the uh, intermittency needs and some of the seasonality needs of energy is, is going to be an important part of, of filling out the picture. <clears throat> Great. Thank you, Mike. Um, we're right on schedule to move to the demand side of the conversation. Paul. Yeah. Paul. Sorry to interrupt this, Amy. I just wanted to make another comment real quickly on sure. kind of talked about storage, which is a big part of it. And then obviously the trans, you know, transport is another thing, for example, if it's not a pipeline. Um, and somebody asked, I think, in one of the chats about the cost of hydrogen. And sometimes in these sessions, people talk about the cost of producing hydrogen with electrolysis. But then the question is, what's the cost, for example, in mobility applications at the pump? And the cost at the pump then involves not only the production of the hydrogen, but obviously the transportation to the pump and the compression, the storage and dispensing. And so uh, that's sometimes why people are asking the different prices. You can talk about the price to produce the hydrogen, but that's not the price that it ends up being at the pump because you have to take the other things into, into account. Um, and I think in, in the mobility space right now, a lot of the things are either transported in tube, ta tube trailers or um, uh, cryogenic liquid tanker trucks. Um, and for that, you know, I think there's still question in mobility whether you, it'll be gaseous uh, hydrogen or liquid hydrogen. Um, but right now all the onboard storage like on a vehicle tends to be gaseous. And right now the, the get, you, while there has been on-site um, production, so if you have, um, it, depending on your hydrogen demand, you can put an electrolyzer on-site and then a hydrogen refueling station on-site that that services. Um, but more often you're gonna see probably in the short term, a more regional approach where there's some centralized hydrogen production that is then 
transported via tube trailer or whatever to hydrogen refueling stations in a you know 200 250 mile radius uh, kind of thing. So I just wanted to to touch on that that transport element is is another element uh, beyond just the storage. Yeah, um, that's that's a that is a great point, and I, I think based on that comment and what Maggie was saying earlier about everything really being an optimization exercise, that there's really no one size fits all solution, then really you have to um, assess the situation and make the best decision for that um, system and, and use case. Um, the only thing I'll add real quickly, just for completeness here, so that the folks on the call don't think we've overlooked this um, with with three people who pretend to talk about hydrogen all day, um, is, is that one thing that is also part of the transportation uh, discussion is conversion of hydrogen to some other type of carrier molecule, whether that be ammonia or metal hydrides. And these, again, go to what are the added costs of conversions back and forth between those things, but what are the savings in terms of, of um, transportability ease? So right. just throwing that out there, we don't have to go into it, but right. so want anyone to think we overlooked it. There's yet another option to overcoming the, the storage and transport challenge, which is actually just then converting it into something else that's easier to move around, which could be ammonia. Great, okay. Um, thank you, Maggie. So um, on the demand side, um, really we got a lot of the questions that we're uh, using today came from uh, the audience who, when they registered, submitted questions and we kind of just boiled those down. So um, on the demand side, really, I think the new opportunities with green hydrogen mostly fall into a couple categories of uh, transportation and, and, and buildings. And uh, Mike, I'll come back to you on the, on the built environment. Um, I've been hearing a lot for the last several years of like this mantra of electrify everything and then decarbonize electricity. Mike, should we electrify everything? Well, electrification will definitely be part of the solution. I think, uh, you know, we're at a point where the challenge is so great to meet um, deep decarbonization goals by mid-century that we should really be creating a portfolio of solutions and, and you know, not take any options off the table at this point. Um, you know, one with the existing uh, building environment, um, you've got building, heating, space heating, and water heating needs. Uh, and electrification, definitely high efficiency, electric heat pumps uh, work in many climates. Uh, however, in colder climates, uh, there's just a massive amount of energy that's needed to, to, to heat uh, buildings. And I think we saw evidence of that in um, the Texas events, the cold snap down there uh, in recent months, also in the polar vortex of you know five years ago or so, where just as an example, in Illinois, where I live, um, residential uh, peak energy demand for natural gas uh, on any given day is is five over five times the peak energy demand for electricity uh, throughout the year. So you know we use a lot more energy in a gaseous form in cold weather to heat buildings in, in cold climates because when you think about it, we're in Chicago, you know we might be uh, heating a building up to 70 degrees from zero degrees outside. And even on the hottest summer days, uh, cooling a building from 95 degrees down to 75 degrees is, is much less of a, of a peak energy uh, need. Uh, and then we also have to manage that peak through storage. So we think that um, using some form of, of gaseous energy carrier that's very energy dense uh, will have its its role in fulfilling uh, building heating needs, especially in northern climates. Uh, we think that uh, a combination of renewable natural gas and hydrogen blends can fill that need. Uh, we do a lot of the appliance uh, research and testing here at, at GTI for high efficiency uh, thermal heat pumps, for example. Uh, other types of micro combined heat and power systems, uh, just high efficiency uh, HVAC units. And you know what we're finding is that um, there is an acceptable percentage of hydrogen that can be blended and burned in those existing systems. Uh, it differs by manufacturer and by model and unit type, et cetera. But you know, in many cases, 
uh, and sort of a rule of thumb that's been assumed in, in modeling efforts is that could be possibly up to 20 percent. Um, you know, as we uh, continue to evolve into standards for hydrogen blends, uh, I think the, the manufacturers of uh, new appliances and heating systems will be able to uh, essentially plan for that and modify uh, the burner um, geometry and be able to uh, accommodate hydrogen blends uh, on a very affordable basis, consistent with what we're doing for for natural gas. Uh, the, the implications potentially are um, you, because of the, the flame uh, speed of hydrogen, uh, you could have more NOx emissions when you start to add hydrogen uh, into the blend. Uh, you could also have potentially um, you know, reliability issues uh, in terms of using a, a different type of fuel and, and something that was designed for natural gas. But yes, we definitely feel that there is a role for a low carbon gaseous energy carrier in the built environment. And we think we can uh, evolve and transition to continue to, to use that as part of the decarbonization uh, portfolio over time. Okay, um, <clears throat> I'm not sure I'm convinced. Uh, Maggie and Amy, any, either of you have uh, a strong opinion on uh, the role of, of, of hydrogen in the built environment? Maggie, probably better for you to take that one. Sure. Um, I mean, we, as a, a company whose primary responsibility is to produce and transmit electrons, obviously we, we have a little bit more of a leaning towards thinking that electrification is going to be a, a big part of things. I think, you know, especially the light duty vehicle fleet, it, it seems like that's certainly heading towards the electrification. I know we're not talking about that just quite yet, but. Um, but I, I think I generally agree with Mike's point on there just being sort of a regional climate variation to where it makes sense to electrify buildings and where it makes sense to still rely on some sort of gaseous fuel. Um, so we'll just, we'll see how that plays out. Um, yeah. I think we should try to electrify as much as we can. Um, it seems like the more efficient way to actually get towards a, a clean economy overall. Uh, but I recognizing that that's not going to be possible everywhere. There's certainly, I mean, this is, this is why hydrogen has entered uh, the ethos right now is because how do we get to that last 30% of decarbonization throughout all sectors? There just really are things that can't be electrified away. Steel production being a great example, things that really require some sort of really high heat source. Again, going to the, there's only so hot you can get with a heat pump or, uh, you know, can't replace a blast furnace. Um, so. Right. Um, well, let's move to transportation. Amy, do you, I know that you're more on the power to gas side of Cummins, but Cummins obviously has a huge role in the transportation sector. So, so where, where does hydrogen win in, you know, yeah. trucks, boats, uh, cars, <laughs> airplanes? Right. You know, where do we go batteries? Where do we go biofuels? Where do we go hydrogen? Yeah, well, I, I can give a little bit of a view. And actually, I'm on both. I've got fuel cells and I've got hydrogen production. So I'm on both sides. Um, yeah, for, for us, it's interesting. I think, um, you know, it's clear that, as everybody said, there's no one technology that's right for every application and every geography and, you know, ev uh, everything. And, you know, we remind people that a fuel cell electric vehicle is an electric vehicle. It also has a battery in it. Uh, so it depends. You can make the fuel cell dominant or you can make the battery dominant and have it be more of a range extender. Um, but for us, it's been really interesting. I agree with what Maggie said. I think on light duty vehicles, you can see that, you know, uh, battery electric is a, is a good solution. It's gained momentum. And, you know, probably most of that market is going to go battery electric. Um, I think for us, we've seen that in the, in the heavier uh, duty applications, like heavy duty trucks, uh, trains, even buses, uh, and some other applications, you know, we're looking at it in mining trucks, um, in, in almost all kinds of in, in industrial equipment. And I think, you know, in, it's different things. So in buses, for example, I think a few years ago, a lot of our bus OEMs thought the buses would eventually go all electric. Um, and the leaders that I've talked to the, over the past uh, year and a half have said they've come to think that there's a role for hydrogen buses as well in their portfolio, up to maybe 20%. And some of that matters, again, where the buses operate, if they need more range flexibility, is it colder climate, all of those kind of things, and customers need it. The other thing is that 
still an issue for fleets where you have a big fleet of vehicles, you know, or buses that come back to a base that cost an investment uh, to have a charging infrastructure for those is exorbitant in some places, not only just the charging infrastructure, but to get the amount of electricity required to your site to be able to do that. And then the, you know, fees and everything else you need to pay. Um, uh, and the flexibility of the fleet. So that's, you know, somewhere where we see uh, fuel cell electric vehicles. On heavy duty trucks, it's a little bit of a different calculus. And that's because by the time you got the size and weight of the batteries, you give up payload, which is the, the you know, amount of goods that you can carry. And that's what, for that, for that industry, that's what they're in the business of, is carrying goods. And so, um, and some of those, uh, as you know, are long haul go across the country. And so need to be able to fuel up quickly. Um, and you can fuel a hydrogen fuel truck just like you do a, you know, a, a diesel truck um, at the pump in 10 or 15 minutes. Um, another area that we've seen, you know, which has actually been a bit of a leader for us is in rail. And that's again, a bit of a different calculus. If you already have electrified tracks, then a fully electrified train can be a good solution. Where you don't have electrified tracks, it's really, um, you know, can be high cost to electrify those tracks up to a million euros a kilometers or more uh, and other logistics of where it is. So a fuel cell electric vehicle gives you that option, uh, a fuel cell electric train uh, to electrify uh, the, the, the train and go to zero emission vehicles. Uh, again, same thing, fast to fill up. You can, you can have hydrogen production on the side and you can fill a train in, you know, in, in 10 or 15 minutes as well, a passenger train. And now those for us are in commercial um, supply um, in Europe to start. So those, uh, again, those, uh, I think heavier duty, you know, uh, more difficult duty cycles are the ones that we'll probably see going first. And then as you get to lighter vehicles, they'll be more heavily fully electric. And then the ones in between, you know, will probably have a mix is, is our view right now. Uh, we are seeing a lot of interest in marine, you mentioned as well. We don't do as much in aviation, I've, especially large passenger aviation. We have done some for smaller kind of people mover aviation. Uh, I do think there's a lot of interest in that space as well. And, you know, there's others here who may be able to talk to specifically aviation more than I am. But that cool. so, um, hydrogen trains, that's awesome. So it really is the, the little molecular engine that could. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, that's, that's awesome. Um, sorry, children's uh, books are my favorite literary reference. So um, <laughs> that's where I find inspiration. Uh, all right, let's move to uh, the lightning round to uh, close this out. So the lightning round, I've got a, um, a few topics. And the question is, are you long or short on each of these for the audience long or short like put on your investor hat are you are you a buyer or a seller are you are you in or, or, or are you out so um, I'll, I'll try to mix up the order you do not have to defend your answer here if you want to you can but keep it short but you do not have to defend your answer so Maggie I'll start with you are you long or short on blue hydrogen I'm long in the near term I think it's going to be a transition all right vehicle. Mike uh, I'm long in the near term and, and longer term. Uh, like I say, we'll see who wins the race to the bottom. And I think there'll be a role for, for many different production technologies. Amy? I think I'm long in the longer term. And uh, it may be a little longer for the US than in other places. Um, all right, well, I'm not a panelist, but just to mix it up, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be short blue hydrogen because if they're still emitting 10%, then it's not good enough and we gotta buy down the cost curve of uh, purely uh, green hydrogen production. Um, but I'm gonna keep my mouth shut now. Uh, next one, uh, I'll start with you, Amy. Are you long or short on hydrogen powered electronics or hydrogen powered devices? So replacing those AA batteries or small lithium ion batteries. I think I'd be a poor investor in this space because I don't know enough. <laughs> so can I say uh, neutral at this point uh, on the sidelines? Sure, Mike. I'm short. I think batteries are working just fine in that space, and uh, I don't know if I want to be carrying hydrogen around in uh, in my pocket wherever I go. Maggie. I do. All right. Uh, next one, Mike. I'll start with you. Are you long or short on large? centralized electrolysis plants? Uh, I would say long, you know, especially in certain regions where renewable energy costs are low. And you know, once, we, once we get to the scale that's needed, um, 
I think it's going to be part of the solution. Maggie? I think you know where I stand. I'm, I'm long that, but I uh, certainly don't foreclose on it being in a distributed nature as well. Amy? Yeah, definitely long. Great. And then, uh, Amy, sticking with you, are you long or short on the EU stimulus plan to produce green uh, hydrogen to deploy 40 gigawatts of electrolysis, which for context, I believe currently there's about 250 megawatts deployed worldwide and that they are looking to deploy 40 gigawatts. I think that was like 200 times uh, increased capacity through their stimulus plan. Um, Amy, are you long or short? I, I, I'm, I'm long, I'm long, but there, that will happen over time. And it's a little related to the one before in, in, in a way to large centralized electrolysis plants as well. Those will have to happen for that to happen. All right, Mike. I'm long. I think uh, you know we got to be swinging for the fences and set set big goals in order to uh, you know achieve this challenge of decarbonization. I think it's also going to drive uh, from production. You know, you have the 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 make, move, store, and use, and we're gonna that's going to drive the conversion of the transportation and transmission and, and storage infrastructure as well, which which is going to require some planning and some investment. Maggie. I guess I don't know how to be long or short of policy, but um, I, I am hopeful that it is going to be effective and not um, turn into a, a huge catastrophic cost to, you know, European ratepayers and taxpayers uh, in a way that doesn't make transferable to other parts of the world, primarily the U.S. And Mike, are you long or short on cities banning gas hookups in buildings? Um, I'm short. Again, I think we shouldn't be taking options off the table at this point. Uh, we're going to need a portfolio of solutions. Maggie? I'll answer that by saying that the other day I tried to cook with a wok on an electric stove and it didn't go that well. So. Have you tried induction? <laughs> <laughs> I hear they're great. Amy, what about you? Yeah, I'm short, same as Mike. All right. Well, um, that that's a wrap. I mean, what a great way to uh, close out Q1 than uh, talking hydrogen. So uh, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, Susie, uh, you want to turn it to uh, Q&A audience? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, everybody. That was, that was great. Um, we received just a ton of questions during this. Uh, we're not going to be able to get to all of them. I think it's good food for thought for some additional blog posts that we might put out with these questions answered. So stay tuned for that. But I'm going to try to get to one question for each of our speakers. Uh, so, so let's start off with, with Maggie. Maggie, what are your thoughts on the financeability of hydrogen supply materials? Uh, we've seen the importance of efficient financing for the development of wind, solar. I'm curious about how, about what can help IPPs or other energy developers navigate high CapEx demands of hydrogen infrastructure? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think there's a lot of hype around it. So I think there are people who are gonna go long from an equity sense, but um, as you guys probably have also heard, there's, there's a lot of uh, federal funds that are gonna be made available for things like transmission and, and offshore wind and presumably also hydrogen um, through, facilities like the DOE loan guarantee program that Jigger Shaw is now in charge of. So I, I think that there are definitely going to be pathways to get these things financed in the near term um, in the U.S. and certainly overseas as well. Great, great. Um, Mike, are there any other benefits to a widespread hydrogen adoption besides decarbonization? Well, that certainly would be uh, the primary one, um, you know, the decarbonization as well as potentially uh, other environmental benefits of moving away from, from fossil fuels. Um, you know, I think it's a matter of transitioning the infrastructure and being able to, to also uh, provide an affordable means of, of you know, the, that form of, of energy carrier as well as what we're challenged with. Okay, okay. And then, uh, Amy, we've, we've talked a lot about, you know, various industries that might be, might be good, suitable for, for hydrogen. You know, what industries might not be good fits? That's a good question. Um, 
yeah, I don't know. I guess, you know, I mean, I mean maybe it's, it's where, um, you know, fully electric solutions are suitable. I mean, again, when we talked about in um, mobility, if it's lighter duty, shorter driving distances, back to base, those are examples. Um, if there are other, and I'm thinking in an industry, I spend so much time thinking about what it is good for, um, less time thinking about what it's not. So again, the really hard to abate sectors are the ones where it is sort of easy to abate and something that e easily done with electrification or others, then it's probably not. Okay. And then um, one last question, maybe for, for everybody. Uh, one of the questions that we got, you know, a lot of different varieties of, you know, related, were related to cost. Um, you know, everybody wants to understand, um, you know, the costs associated with hydrogen. How do the, how, how do we get to lower costs? How do regulations come into play? Um, you know, what, what's the tax situation? So do I, do, do any of you have some resources that we can share with folks so that they can explore this topic a little bit more on their own? I know that the cost conversation can get really in depth. Um, but we'd love to at least be able to provide them with some, some places to look and, and, and learn. Yeah, there's, there's quite a bit out there. Uh, you know, the IEA put out a, a hydrogen report in 2019 that's often used as a reference. There was also uh, uh, just more recently McKinsey and the fuel cell hydrogen. The hydrogen uh, council. Council, yeah, yeah, put out a report. Uh, but then just about every investment bank has put out a report as well. I know the Goldman Sachs carbonomics uh, series was a, was a good one that, and, and, you know, you'll find some variation between all those sources. That's one of the things that's challenging is kind of sorting through that. These are all projected costs too. So we'll really only know when we get to scaled up and demonstrated, um, applications of, of each of those forms of, of hydrogen. Amy, Maggie, any additional resources that come to mind? Uh, those were the same, the IEA, IEA and the uh, McKinsey Hydrogen Council would have been my first suggestions. Um, I think what you'll see is it might set different ideas, but some of it's also timing. You know, when things will reach certain costs or when it'll reach cost parity with other um, options. It, it's mm -hmm. The timing is kind of nice as well. Right. Um, just so folks can see, Amy, um, our marketing manager is putting those links um, to those reports into the chat. So please make sure you snag them before we close out. Uh, and on that note, we're getting real close to the end of the hour here. So to make sure we, we let everybody go on time, uh, we wanna thank Maggie, Amy, and Mike for, for their expertise today. I think this was a, a really interesting conversation. Uh, you know, we covered a lot of different areas and applications of hydrogen. Um, you know, again, as we saw, of your questions come through, we're gonna we're gonna make sure that we answer those. Uh, so stay tuned for some additional resources um, with those questions answered. Before you go, um, we just want to announce our next webinar, um, which is going to be coming up on Wednesday, May 12th from 3 to 4 p.m. That's going to be on the future of carbon removal technologies, um, which, you know, like hydrogen is, is becoming a very timely topic. You know, we've heard it come up in the past, but it feels like now things are starting to get real with those conversations. So we'll be exploring that. When you leave the Zoom, you should be directed there uh, to sign up for that. And you'll also get that invitation as well as the recording from today's conversation uh, via email tomorrow. Uh, so with that, we're gonna say thank you all for attending. Um, thank you to our speakers and Paul for moderating, and we will see you all again soon. <laughs>